Welcome to whiskey.com where fine spirits meet. My name is Lüning, Horst Lüning. I'm the master taste of whiskey.com and today we have the FAQs number eight. Our frequently asked questions and if you're willing, if you're asking questions, please indicate them with a hashtag whiskey.com without a dot in between just whiskey.com and I, well, before I'm uh, taking a new video, I'm going over the social media, our, our forum, uh, and I'm looking after hashtag whiskey.com. And uh, whenever you key in something different, I, I won't find it. Yeah. The first question was, are there differences between the malt whiskies in Ireland regarding the region? As in Scotland, where you say the isle, islands or Isla is very smoky, the islands are intense, the northern highlands are citrus fruity, uh, the space side is fruity and malty, and the lowlands is very smooth. Yeah. No, <laughs> it's not true for Ireland. Uh, and at first, I will tell you why there are these regional influences. It's not the microclimate. Typically, people think it's the microclimate, it's the, the well, the special air. But, but if you have a look at the air in Scotland, a steadily going wind from the west, and the air comes over the Isle of Isla, and 20 minutes later, it's on the mainland and at the warehouses there. There's no difference what, what should happen to the air in 20 minutes if it's passing over. Nothing. So the humidity is the same, the air pressure is the same, uh, and the smell is the same. You shouldn't have your warehouses behind <laughs> a stinky factory, of course. Uh, but those times are long gone in Scotland. Um, the similarities between the whiskies in a special region uh, comes from the people. People communicated over the centuries where the whiskey distillery is produced and when they were lining up in the pub, they asked themselves or others, uh, how are you uh, distilling the whiskey? How long is your fermentation going on? Uh, what do you prefer? Uh, how often do you clean? Uh, and so on. And uh, the proprietors of the whiskey distilleries, they looked at the competitor and said, well, he's selling more whiskey than me. Therefore, the next stills I, I'm ordering will look the same than his. Others said, well, now we're uh, increasing production getting new stills in a new still house and the old stills, well, they are valuable, still valuable, and I'm selling them to a smaller distillery. So a lot of distilleries started with old stills from other distilleries and some distilleries built up a conglomerate of different stills from different distilleries that were placed in before. So it's the people, it's the communication between the people and the further the distilleries are away from each other. The less communication is there and the less knowledge is transferred between the distilleries. And so there is a definite difference between the very north distilleries in Scotland and the very south. Um, if you're looking over to Ireland, <laughs> there are just <laughs> two distilleries. Um, which uh, produce malt whiskey. Uh, that's, of course, Bushmills in the north and uh, Coolies at the very north of the Republic of Ireland, just close to the border to Northern Ireland. And those two distilleries are the only ones which produce whiskey. There is a third one, the Kilbegan. I think they started production in 2012 or 13, but I've never come across a whiskey from that distillery. Uh, Probably this whiskey is going already into the brands of, of Kool-Aid, uh, but I'm not aware of a single malt whiskey directly from Kilbaggen. Um, but, oh, and two, <laughs> is too few <laughs> to have statistics from. So, but there are new distilleries coming up in Ireland as well, as in Scotland. Um, there is a 
distillery working in Echlinville. I've never got a whiskey from there. I think it's a, a very new one. Then the Teeling Distillery uh, in Dublin, we have a, pic, uh, a video of that distillery. Then the Dublin Distillery itself, it's, I think, just built up and producing since 2015, yeah. Uh, then further down the coast is Altec, and then where in the, in the south, it's West Cork, and in the very southwest, uh, it's Dingle. So, and good news, there is a dozen more distilleries in the planning and in the work. So there will be more whiskey distilleries in Ireland, but will they have a regional character? No, because uh, communication today takes place over very long distances. If you have a look uh, at the still manufacturer, so a lot of those distilleries will have their stills uh, from Richard Forsyth, from Forsyth's corporation in, in Rothes. They produced, I think, 50% of the stills in Scotland and they have a uh, dependency in, in the US where they produce for the micro distilleries there. Um, so there are more and more stills coming up and they might look a little bit the same, but the communication does not happen inside a region, but over the uh, producer of the stills. So there might be similarities and the procedures. When do I start my middle cut? When do I finish my middle cut? And so on. Those procedures typically come with the, uh, with the stills. So when they started up the Pune distillery, I heard that uh, there had been specialists uh, which uh, adjusted uh, the, the still to the optimum procedure and uh, they just making very little uh, changes to this uh, procedure. So there will be an influence, but it won't be regional. Next theme. Do you know what an umbrella brand is? Well, an umbrella brand is a brand which stands above several other brands, but isn't visible. Um, for example, uh, you know these sweets, Bounty, Mars, Milky Way, Snickers, Twix, those sweets are monolithic, monolithic, monolithic brands. Monolithic brands, yes. Uh, and only very few people know that there is a umbrella brand behind it. And in former times, uh, it was called um, here in Europe. It was called Master Food, and uh, somewhere else, I think FM. But FM uh, was the the part of the pet food. Uh, so there had been uh, uh, an umbrella brand for that and, and then changed the name, I think, to Mars Incorporated. So Mars, Milky Way, Snickers, Bounty, Celebrations, Dove, Twix, Ballisto, you name it, are all monolithic brands below these umbrella brand of Mars Incorporated. Uh, you can see there are some some packs where um, Mars, Milky Way, Snickers and Bounty is mixed in very small uh, sizes. Um, there's also this umbrella branding with the FM Corporation, which was owned by uh, Mars Incorporated bef before uh, they, I think they, they fusioned into one a big company. And there is the pet food, Cesar, Chappie, Dreamic, uh, Dreamies, Frolic, Kitty Cat, Sheba, Pedigree, Whiskers, you name it, all the same. Um, let's have a look at the whiskey. There had been an umbrella uh, called the Ascot Malt Cellar. Never heard of that. Well, they... Uh, contained six whiskies 
uh, and they were put on the market in 1982. It was the Rosebank 8, the Linkwood 12, Talisker 8, like a Woolin 12, and two uh, vetted malls called today blended malls, then vetted malls, Glenleven and Threskonnen. They are long gone. And whenever you find one of those old Ascot Mall cellar malls, they are expensive. I think the Lagavulin, 12 years old, the old one, I think is already a thousand euros, pounds, dollars. Yes, I think so. Um, they try to promote this umbrella uh, brand, Ascot Mall cellar. Um, but they did not succeed in in every market. So a few went well, and others they said no, we won't pro uh, market that. So the uh, the strategy behind it wasn't executed very well. Then in 1989 they started again, and the name was chosen much better. It was, they were called the Classic Malts. And here we have uh, the classic malts. If you look here at this, at this label and the classic malts, it's a trademark. And they consist of six bottles. Here we have a Lagavulin 16, a Talisker 10, uh, a Craigmore 12. And uh, they consist of six. Uh, here we have the others. It's a Glen Kinchy 12 a Dalwini 15 and an Oban 14. So here we have six whiskies below the classic malts and the advantage of having this umbrella brand means you're spending money for a campaign and six products, six individual brands uh, receive the advantage out of this spent money. Here they are there to promote the single brand and from those single brands uh, a lot of spin-offs came out like the, uh, not with the red one, but with the green one, um, the Lagavulin uh, got a 12 years old and a uh, uh, distiller's edition, the Talisker got an 18 year old, a 25, I uh, took videos of the tasting of those already uh, and a lot more Storm, Dark Storm, Nice Point, ooh, 175 uh, and 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 from the Craigmore there's there are only just a few uh, but they started to spin off to, pr uh, to promote the individual brand. So these the classic malts uh, were an umbrella and from there they developed each of the brands um, and they got a new one it's called uh, the classic malts collection in this is more than a dozen uh, individual brands containing Cardu, Nakandu and a lot more Kalila ah, you name it you, you know it you know that um, and those 12 or 12 plus didn't work well so the name, the Classic Malts Collection, isn't very well known. So they were too many. So you can't uh, produce a marketing for a dozen or more uh, distilleries on a single page in a, in a magazine. No, that won't work. So there, this collection is known at the dealers. They know when they got the advertisements what's in there, but uh, it wasn't able uh, to bring that to the final customer. Today they changed again at the, well there is a <laughs> uh, an invisible company behind it like this FM or Mars or Master Foods uh, Incorporated. It's called Diageo and Diageo uh, owns, well, the majority of the malt whiskey distilleries in Scotland and uh, all those six whiskies I told you from, I told you of, uh, are in possession of uh, Diageo and these two, the green and the turkeys as well 
And here they changed and said, well, we establish a new brand called The Singleton. No distillery name, The Singleton. And very small and very little. We write in italics so that you can't read it very well. The name of the distillery on the bottle. In this case, the green one, Glendallen, and the turquoise one, uh, Glenort. There's another one, I think it's... it's uh, it's a brown, a light brown, um, it's Dufftown, the Singleton of Dufftown. And the entry user bought a bottle somewhere, the travel value, local dealer, uh, supermarket, tasted it and said, well, that's good. Mm. Very balanced, as they advertise it, and they are. And they say, well, I will buy the Singleton again. And then Oh, there's another color. No idea. It's 12 years old as well. Try that. Well, oh, the Singleton. Very good. Very balanced. So, and then and the distillery runs out of stocks. You can see the bottom of the warehouses. And then, well, then they move over to another distillery. Write the name of it very small. And sell it as the Singleton. And the connoisseurs, like you and me, we look at the small name of the distillery and say, well, this is a Glendallen, this is a named distillery, that's true. It's not a NDS malt. Haha, <laughs> that was an April Fool joke running around. NDS means uh, no distillery statement. Those are those fantasy name malts. Uh, and so this is no NDS, this is a exact, locatable distillery. And then we at connoisseurs are satisfied as well. And the novice, the entry uh, connoisseur, says, well, the Singleton, a very good one. And then sometime he will read on the bottle and look and say, well, what's Glendullen? The Singleton of Glendullen. And then he will look into Google look after Glendallen, <laughs> they will find whiskey.com and they are in our uh, whiskey database they are able to find pictures of the real existing Glendallen distillery and then knowledge flows and then he recognizes that the Singleton is just an umbrella brand and uh, that the company is really selecting those whiskey that are tasting in his direction, which he is preferring. And then the umbrella brand, the Singleton, has worked very well. The last is, the last question was, I tasted this Loch Lomond original whiskey a few weeks ago and it was quite bitter in the aftertaste. Ooh. Ah. Yeah. And then uh, somebody asked and said, why are they producing this bitter stuff? Nobody likes that and they could stop that. Uh, well, not really. Uh, all the beer drinkers like bitterness. There are hops, bitter hops in beer. So people like bitterness. If you look at chocolate with a high cocoa content, like 75, 85. I just found a, a chocolate with a 95 content it was really dry and really bitter, but very interesting. And people like coffee. Not the light ones from the Americas, but the new ones, the more intense ones. The mochas from Turkey or the Arabian style coffee. And there are the Italian espresso. They're, they're so bitter, they typically put a few spoonful of sugar in it. Don't do that with this whiskey, no. Um, so bitterness is a, well, a taste which a lot of people like. And he can't uh, say that if he's not liking bitterness, that nobody will like that. In whiskey in particular, I don't like the bitterness if the whiskey is otherwise quite weak. So it's like white wine and there's a little 
a lot of grain in it and a, just a little fruitiness and then you have this bitter aftertaste. No, well, that's not mine. And uh, I like bitterness if the whiskey has matured for years and years, added a lot of aromas and then the bitterness comes in the aftertaste on top of everything. Then I like the bitterness, but just bitterness as a single taste, no, not for me. Where does the bitterness come from? Well, from the oak wood of the casks. Um, the oak or the cask are toasted from the inside, so they are heated up to over 150 centigrade so that the uh, celluloses will divide into mulch or into wood sugars and those wood sugars would be caramelized uh, and from that caramelized wood sugars you receive the brown color and the caramel flavor and um, the lignin that's a substance in the wood which brings the hardness so in an, an oak tree you have around 30 to 35 percent of lignin and this lignin uh, if it's heated a lot, then it changes to vanillin. There the uh, vanilla aroma from the cask comes from. And then you might have had sherry or another wine in the whiskey cask. Now you fill in and you suck out all the wine tastes, uh, all the vanilla, all the caramel. Uh, and then you take the whiskey away, put another one in and what's left in the cask it's tannins it's bitter tannins and therefore uh, re 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 reuse casks just brings tannins and bitterness in the whiskey and then i say mm, no not for me um but if you have a bigger or enough content from first fill or second fill casks where there is a normal wood aroma in as well then the bitterness combines with those aromas and then in the end the bitterness as well yeah is appreciated by me thank you very much for watching stay tuned there's more to come and please feel free to share this video with your friends